Well, a very good morning to each and every one of you. So glad to be here where we worship God, study His Word, love one another, and reach the lost. Again, if you're visiting with us, so happy uh, that you have come this morning. Hope that you will be lifted up and encouraged in your walk with the Lord. We're getting ready to have a lesson from God's Word. We're going to start in Acts chapter 26, if you'll turn there, in a lesson called Don't Kick Against the Goads. Don't Kick Against the Goads. <clears throat> In Acts 26, Saul, who later becomes Paul, and it's important just to know Saul is his Jewish name. Paul is simply the Greek name for Saul. So I'll use them interchangeably <laughs> throughout the lesson. Saul is uh, recounting his conversion story from back in Acts chapter 9, but he's telling it this time to King Agrippa. And in Acts 26, we'll just pick up in verse 12 down through 14. He says, While so engaged as I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goad. A goad was a sharp stick. You can kind of see it. It was really hard to get a good quality picture of a goad. It's the best I could do there. But it was a sharp stick used to provoke and motivate oxen to get moving and to go in the right direction. If you had a field to plow... You would put, and this is also what you're seeing here on this screen, you would put this wooden bar across a pair of oxen, and this wooden bar was called a yoke. Here's a more modern picture of what a yoke might look like, and so that makes sense when Jesus says, you know, come to me. He says, my, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's what he's talking about here with the yoke. But what happens... When you want an ox to plow your field and you're driving them from behind, but that ox just decides, you know what, I don't really feel like plowing today. <laughs> I think I'm just going to stand here. The ox is a lot bigger than you are. So what are you going to do? Well, that's where the goad comes in. Um, here's a picture of a, of a man with a goad standing behind these, these oxen. And you'd use this goad to poke them. And to get them moving in the right direction, which sounds kind of like a scary thing to do uh, as well, depending on their reaction. But the, it's important to understand that the goad was not meant to injure the ox. The goad was not meant to stab them and get them to start bleeding and, and have them hobbling across your field. No, it was just to be uncomfortable enough to where the ox doesn't want to stand there and take that. He's going to get moving. But what if that ox thinks to himself, you know what, I'm getting a little tired of that goat. <laughs> and the next time this guy pokes me with that thing, I'm kicking that thing out of his hand. Or how about I just kick him instead? Well, when that would happen, sometimes as the ox in his rebellion would kick back against the, the multiple goading, the goads of the ox goad, <laughs> it would jab into his leg and actually injure him, and actually stab him and hurt and, and cause damage. And when that happens, the original purpose for the goad is lost. You see, if, if the ox were to just accept the goading, it might be a little uncomfortable, but it would not actually be harmful. The goad only becomes harmful to the ox when he resists the will of the farmer, and when he kicks back against the prompting the goading of the farmer. And when he does that, it only makes it harder on the ox and harder on the farmer in the process. Jesus says to Saul, that's what you are doing. I've been goading you, Saul. I've been trying to provoke you and guide you in a certain direction. But instead of following my goads, you kick back, you rebel against me. I have work for you to do, Saul, but every time you rebel, every time you kick back against my goading, it only gets harder for you. You're only making things worse for yourself, Saul. 
Can you relate to this? I know I can. You ever rebelled against something you didn't like? Whether it was from God or maybe advice or admonishment from a friend or from, from an elder or for, from teachers or your boss at work. And, and you rebelled against that because you wanted to do it your own way. But then what you found was that it only made things worse for you in the process. That you only hurt yourself by ignoring their instruction. Uh, at my old Kung Fu school, <laughs> my instructor he would say, I will only tell you something three times. And if you do not listen to what I say, it means you're not ready to hear it. Now, I wondered about that because I thought, okay, you know, very mysterious. Whoa. <laughs> he would say that as a Kung Fu instructor, right? But then I thought, well, how am I supposed to know when I'm ready to hear it? Well, over the years, the answer to that question became clear. I was ready to hear it. When I found out my way was not working. When I kept getting punched over and over and over again, and I couldn't figure out why do I keep getting punched all the time, that's when I would go to him and say, hey, how come I'm getting hurt all the time and I can't do anything about this? And that's when he would tell me the exact same thing that he already told me three times before, but I wasn't ready to hear it, but now I'm ready. This time is different. This time my ears are open, I'm ready to obey because I know doing things my way only got me hurt, only made things worse, only hindered my progress. That's how it was for Saul. Because resisting God's goad is a dead end road. And I want us to see in scripture how this principle played out in Saul's life and make application to ourselves along the way. I don't often rhyme. <laughs> a little corny, but sometimes the corny things are the most memorable. I hope that this will be really helpful to you. I want to show you three things that we learn about this text in Acts 26 and Saul's life in general. Number one, that God goads. It is encouraging to know that God is not detached or uninvolved in people's lives. He actively provokes us and nudges us and, and pushes us in the right direction to accomplish his purposes. When Jesus tells Saul, it is hard for you to kick against the goads, notice he uses the word in the plural. He doesn't say it's hard for you to resist or to kick against the goad. He says the goads which means there have been multiple times when Jesus was goading Saul. The Lord had been working on Saul over the years. This encounter on the road to Damascus, that was not the first time that Jesus was involved in Saul's life. In fact, in Galatians chapter 1, Paul will later write this, When God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased. I, I just want you to see there, I know I stopped mid-sentence, trying to emphasize this idea that it's not like God was completely absent from Paul's life until Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. No, God had been goading Paul and pushing him in this direction from birth. And what are some ways God did that? Well, number one, the scriptures. In Acts 22 and verse 3, Saul will say, I am a Jew. I'm born in Tarsus of Cilicia. Brought up in this city, in, in Jerusalem, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. Paul was one of the greatest students of God's law in the Old Testament, and even though he didn't know it at the time, as Phil said in Bible class, the law was pointing to Jesus the whole time. And it was pointing him to the fact that one day, this descendant of Abraham would come and not only be a blessing to Jews, but would also be a blessing to all the families of the earth. What that means is, even from an early age, with all this knowledge of the Old Testament, it was preparing Saul to become this minister to the Gentiles. He didn't know it at the time, but God was working on his heart through the Old Testament scriptures to prepare him to be who he needed to be. Secondly, good teachers. In that same verse, he said he was brought up by Gamaliel, one of the most respected teachers among the Jews at that day. Paul had access to tremendous wisdom and counsel. And because he was 
educated in the city of Jerusalem, it's not like Gamaliel was the only wise teacher uh, that Paul would have been exposed to. He had a lot of influences in his life. I think about Jesus and Jesus's earthly ministry. Now, it is true, we don't really have any indication in Scripture that Saul met Jesus during his earthly ministry. But I'd be surprised if you never met him. And even if you never met him, there's no doubt he would have heard about Jesus and what Jesus was teaching. I mean, think about it. Jesus was here for three years, and every time, three times a year, Jesus would go to Jerusalem for these feasts. Paul would go to the same feast in Jerusalem. So he may not have met Jesus in person. I can give you that. But there's no way he didn't hear about the things that Jesus was teaching. There's no way that there wasn't some small seed planted deep in his heart at some point through the work of Jesus on the earth. Fourthly, failure. Look with me in Acts chapter 8, please. Acts chapter 8. Interesting to think about failure as a goading in Saul's life. But notice Acts chapter 8, after consenting to uh, put Stephen to death, it says this in Acts 8. Uh, let's read verses 2 through 4. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. And therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. So Saul was trying to destroy the church. He was trying to get these Christians to stop spreading this nonsense about the resurrection of Jesus. But notice what Saul was doing was not working. He wanted to destroy the church, to stop the church from spreading. But it seemed like the harder he fought against the church, the more the church spread. It was like a game of whack-a-mole. You kill Stephen, and you got another group of Christians over here in this house. And you, you drag the Christians out of those houses, and hey, there's a, here's another house with Christians. You, and you drag them out, and now you hear, oh, now there's Christians in Damascus. They're, they travel to a whole new city, and there's a bunch of houses full of Christians up in Damascus. Now, couldn't stop it. He was failing. In fact, uh, in, in uh, Acts 26, in verse 11, I've got this on the screen. He tells Agrippa, as I punish them, often in all the synagogues, he says, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. I think the idea that he tried means he did not succeed. I don't know if that means no Christians ever gave in to the pressure and blasphemy. I don't know that. But I think the point is he did not succeed in getting Christians to blaspheme God and to abandon Jesus Christ, and then he's filled with rage. And obviously we know part of that rage is because he believes they're actually sinning against God. He believes this is an idolatrous cult, and he's trying to do this for God's sake, and he's angry. But I think a lot of that anger and that, that it's not just anger, it's, it's rage. It's just, it, it fills him up. Acts 9 says he's, he's breathing out threats. It's like with every exhale, there's just murder coming out of him because he's so frustrated. He can't stop what's happening. He's failing. He's failing. And that's a way that God can goad him. And then I think about Stephen. Saul would have seen the incredible example of Stephen. Standing there watching this man have stones thrown at him until he died. I mean, you just imagine how awful that would be to die by people throwing rocks at you. And yet instead of even lashing out, saying, I hate all you people. You're all going to be lost in hell forever. He's on his knees. He's praying. And he says that I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the throne of God. And then, he, and then he prays for Jesus to receive his spirit. And then he, and he says, don't hold this against me. Saul, he's seeing that. And who knows, and I, I don't know this, but who knows how many other Christians that Saul would have dragged off to prison or signed off on their executions for, and they had the same attitude of Stephen. And so Paul would have seen the same Christ-like submission, not just in Stephen, but other Christians as well, following Jesus. All goads that God was using to provoke and push Saul, to make Saul uneasy, uncomfortable, wondering in the deepest recesses of his heart if maybe there is something to all of this Christianity stuff. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Surprised by Joy, 
he talks about how rebellious he was. And the reason I'm going to quote, it's a fairly long quote, but the reason I'm doing this is because uh, there's kind of a parallel between C.S. Lewis and, and Saul in that they, they were both so rebellious. They were both so resistant to God trying to, trying to bring them to himself. And C.S. Lewis talks about how God just worked on him over time through the books that he read and through the conversations that he had and through the painful experiences of his life and how God relentlessly pursued him despite his resistance. So he says this, you must picture me alone in that room in Magdalene night after night feeling whenever my mind lifted even for a second from my work the steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I so earnestly desired not. That which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed, perhaps the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. Now I need to stop and make a disclaimer. Yes, Lewis does not understand about the need to be baptized. I don't I do not believe the Bible teaches that we're converted by just falling down and praying. But what we definitely see is he converted in his understanding of who God was this night. So he says, I was a reluctant and dejected convert. He says, I did not then see what is now the most shining and obvious thing. The divine humility which will accept a convert even on such terms. Now, this next section. Listen to how similar this is to Saul. He says this, just the the last part of this quote. The prodigal son, at least, walked home on his own feet. But who can duly adore that love which will open the high gate to a prodigal who is brought in kicking, struggling, resentful, and darting his eyes in every direction for a chance the words compel them to come in from Luke 14, 23, have been so abused by wicked men that we shudder at them. But properly understood, they plumb the depth of the divine. The hardness of God is kinder than the softness of men, and his compulsion is our liberation. The compulsion he's talking about is not the Calvinistic concept of irresistible grace. I think that's probably part of what he's talking about when he says compel them to come in is so abused by men. C.S. Lewis isn't saying, well, God just overrid his free will and took over and converted him anyway. No, he's saying God was working on me for so long, for so many years, goading me, relentlessly pursuing me, even though I didn't really want to come to him and do his will. I wanted to do my own will until I came. To the point where I was ready to listen and to obey. That's what it was like for Saul. Saul didn't just come to his senses and return home on his own, like the prodigal son. He seemed to fight against Jesus the whole way, yet Jesus did not give up. And the fact that God goads us even in our stubborn rebellion is an act of his mercy, love, and his grace. I tell you, he does the same for you and me. He goads us through the scriptures. He goads us through our friends. He goads us through brothers and sisters in Christ, through preachers and teachers, through our parents and grandparents. He goads us through failure, disappointment. The question is, am I kicking against God's goad? Is there something that has been gnawing at my conscience that I just know is not right and needs to change? Is there something that somebody told me recently or something that I read in scripture recently that isn't really sitting well with me? It's it's making me uncomfortable because I know I'm not living right for the Lord and there's just something that I need to start doing differently for him. I will confess to you, God has been goading me a lot recently. I have had a lot of unrest because of COVID's effect on my ability to go out and evangelize. 
It really bothers me. And I'll tell you, I've, I've read things and I've heard sermons and I've had conversations with people that just, it's like I'm being poked with a stick. <laughs> and it hurts and it's annoying and I don't want to be poked. But at the same time, I recognize that's, that's God goading me. He's trying to get me. And I'll tell you, you want to know the biggest goad? Studying the book of Acts. Man, it is hard to read the book of Acts and just treat it like a history book. And, well, I know all my facts about this person went here and this person went there. When you read Acts and you see how active people were for God in evangelism and just, just sacrifice and be willing to suffer, that's such a goad when I'm just sitting in my house and, and being comfortable. And, and I'll tell you, I, I just there's a part of me that's kind of enjoyed being a little bit of a stubborn ox uh, recently because it's just easier. I, I don't want to go out right now because everybody's wearing a mask and, and socially distance, social distancing makes things awkward and it's just easier to, to stay in and do nothing than, than to get to work for the Lord. Oh, as I wrote in the bulletin, it's probably one of the most important articles I've, I've written in, in, in my view. It's most challenging to me. God's kingdom must not stop growing because of a virus. There is still work to do. We may have to get more creative, but we can't just stop. We can't just sit back and wait for all of this to just burn down around. Got to be reaching the lost. What is it for you? I mean, that's especially strong for me because that's that's who I, I'm a preacher. I, I am an evangelist. It should be that way for all Christians in some ways, but I feel probably more responsibility for that because, because that's my, my primary role. But maybe it's something else for you that God is goading you toward. Maybe you're not a Christian and events in your life just seem to be conspiring against you and pushing you in the direction of realizing you need Jesus. You need salvation. Or maybe if you're, if you're already a Christian, You've been resisting some much-needed changes that you know you need to make in your behavior toward your spouse or your behavior toward your children. Or maybe you've been realizing how self-reliant you've been. You just need to devote yourself to prayer again. Maybe there's a pet sin around. You just know you need to let go of, but you haven't. Maybe you've become, and I've joked about this with, with different people. Maybe you've become a social recluse because of the virus of the Lord. And, and I know that the social skills, sometimes they just kind of can fade away. And, and God is goading you to, to pick up the phone and, and call your brethren, reach out to people more. I don't know how God is goading you, but I want you to know that God goads us because he loves us. He's trying to get us to accomplish his purposes in the world. And the more we fight and kick against the goads, the worse things get for us. And we'll find ourselves down a dead-end road. And I want to explore that dead-end road with you a bit here. I want to contrast two different scriptures about Paul. We already read the one from uh, Acts 26 in verse 3, where he talks about punishing them. And he says, I became furiously enraged at them, and I was pursuing them even to to foreign cities. Now notice something else written by the same person years later, Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. What a contrast between those two faults. Same person, way different. Because in the months preceding Paul's conversion, he had no peace or joy. He was filled with rage and frustration, and he didn't realize it at the time. But he was actually pursuing, by rejecting Jesus as a sacrifice, he was actually pursuing his own form of righteousness under the law. And it wasn't until later that he realized what a dead-end road that is. Because the law cannot save anyone. The law can only condemn. And he talks about this. Would you turn with me to Romans chapter 7? Please, Romans chapter 7. Of course, he doesn't write this till later. But Romans 7, <clears throat> verses uh, 21 through 24 He's talking about how great God's law is, but then he's saying, but I recognize I can't seem to keep it. I try to keep it, but I, I keep doing the thing that I don't want to do. And so he says in verse 21, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am. 
Who will set me free from the body of this death? And then he says, verse 25, thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. But on one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, of the flesh, the law of sin. What a radical change from Saul who was filled with so much rage, so much frustration before becoming a Christian. And yet now he has the peace of not trying to seek a righteousness of his own through the law, but trading that in for something that actually works <laughs> And that's salvation through faith in Jesus. And he says, once I came to Jesus, Philippians 3, all that other stuff was just rubbish. I counted it all but loss for the sake of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And if you just think about it in Scripture, think about other people and how it goes for them when they resist doing God's word. I think about Jonah. Didn't want to go to Nineveh. (laughs) No, not them. Anybody but them. Don't send me to Nineveh. He ends up getting thrown off a ship into the sea and left to drown. It wasn't until he prayed to God and God saved him through that whale or fish. But it was a dead end road resisting God's will and goading. Or I think about the prodigal son, rebels against his father, found himself all alone with no one who cared for him. And it got so bad, he got to the point where he just was willing even to eat pigs. Proverbs 5, if you turn there with me, Proverbs 5 is a father, and he's trying to to explain to his son the need to stay away from the adulterous woman. A woman without any moral compass, he says, is going to be a disaster for you. He's talking to a a young man here. And his father implores him to give attention to my wisdom, to to listen to my instruction, and then he gives them a warning about what it'll be like when you don't listen to my instruction, when you actually resist my, my goading in that right direction. He says in verse 11, you will groan at your final end when your flesh and your body are consumed, and you say, how I have hated instruction, and my heart spurned reproof. I have not listened to the voice of my teacher, my teachers, nor inclined my ear to my instructors. I was almost in utter ruin. In the midst of the assembly, congregation. In the 1800s, uh, there was an English poet named Francis Thompson. He wrote a poem called The Hound of Heaven. And it was similar to C.S. Lewis's idea of God kind of like being a hound that's, that's relentlessly hunting him, relentlessly chasing him and pursuing him. And while the English is old here and can be a little hard to understand, I might give a little bit of translation as we go along. I thought he captured the idea well, that God is after us. He, is, he wants us to obey him. He's trying to push us into service for him to accomplish his purpose. But when we run away from him and resist him, it does not go well for us. He said this, he said, I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the year. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears, I hid from him in under running laughter. Up vistaed hopes I sped and shot precipitated adown titanic glooms of chasmed fears from those strong feet that followed, followed after, but with hurrying chase and unperturbed or consistent pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy or urgency, they beat. And a voice beat more instant than the feet. All things betray thee. Who betrayest me? Those last four lines, starting with deliberate speed, is a refrain. He repeats it three times in the poem, but he changes the last line each time. So this first time we read it, he ends it with, All things betray thee. Who betrayest me? Translation. When you turn against God, life turns against you. And then he repeats this, the deliberate speed, the majestic urgency, all of that. But then the second time he ends this way, not shelters thee who wilt not shelter. Translation, when you don't give God a home in your heart, your heart will never feel at home. And then the third time, lo, Not contents thee, who contentest not me. Translation, when you don't content God, 
with your obedience, nothing contends you. Can you relate to this poem? Can you relate to those scriptures that we read about Saul or Jonah or the prodigal son? Where you just feel like you're going down a dead end road. If so, could it be that you're fleeing from God or hiding from God? Something that he is goading you to do? If so, this last point is for you. Let God have his way with you. Would you turn back where we started? To Acts chapter 26. I want to read this last section of scripture. In Acts 26, Paul continues explaining to King Agrippa what happened. And let's pick up in verse 15 through 20. It's just one of my favorite set of verses. It's so, so rich. Verse 15 through 20. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but I kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout all the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. Love this section of verses. I love verse 19 because Paul is essentially saying, that's the day I stopped being a stubborn ox. He said, this time when Jesus appeared to me this, with this goad, <laughs> I finally did not prove disobedient. I finally started listening and doing the will of Jesus. And I love this section because it shows us that God is goading us to a purpose, toward a purpose. Jesus is not goading Paul to obey him simply because Jesus is on some power trip and he just you know, wants somebody else to obey him and do what he says. No. He had plans to use Paul in an amazing way. And when we kick against the goats, when we fight and rebel against God, we not only displease Him, we're actually depriving ourselves of the blessings that come with being used for our proper purpose. C.S. Lewis, he, he entitled his book, Surprised by Joy, because he did not realize the joy he would find on the other side of obedience. And in the end, he realized the entire time he was resisting and fighting against God's goads, he was actually resisting and fighting against joy itself. He was only keeping himself from joy by resisting God's goads. And Paul, too, was only hurting himself and keeping himself from the blessings of Christ by kicking against those goads and resisting this glorious purpose for which he was called. We sing a song, let him have his way with thee. And I appreciate that song because the point isn't that God just wants to tell us what to do. No, he's trying to show us who we can become for him. He's trying to help us reach our fullest spiritual potential. The chorus says his power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul. And you will see it was best for him to have his way with thee. Who is God goading you to become today? What is he relentlessly chasing you for with consistent pace and deliberate speed and majestic urgency? What comfort zone is he calling you out of? What risk is he asking you to take that will be so helpful to your spiritual growth? How is God trying to sharpen and prune you to become an instrument for his glory and his kingdom through his goading? 
whatever it is, it may be scary and it may be humbling, but there is joy and peace on the other side. I don't know about you. I don't want to be like a stubborn ox, injuring myself, (laughs) making things harder for myself and worse for my walk with the Lord. I don't want to kick against the goats. And if we, like Paul, will humble ourselves and finally let God have his way with us, then we can say, like Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. If you'll put away your outlines, I'm going to sing a song of invitation. And this song is, Let Him Have His Way With Thee. That is the invitation this morning. The invitation is to stop kicking, stop fighting. Let God have His way with you. Start listening to Jesus' word. Start obeying. Start living the purpose for which you were called. Start experiencing the joy and the peace that comes from serving and obeying your Lord. If we can help you do that this morning by believing in Jesus, by repenting of your sins, confessing Him as your Lord, and being baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. You can start your journey today. And as Jesus said, His yoke is easy, His burden is light. And if you've done that already, but you've been rebelling and kicking, it's time to come home. Time to come back. If we can help you in any way, come back to the Lord this morning. Come forward and let us know how while we stand and sing.